We can measure time, but we cannot measure loss. As a free society, we have an obligation to never forget the sacrifice of those fallen officers and their families. Their memories must never be forgotten. On May 15th, we will gather on the West Front of the United States Capitol in Washington, D.C. to honor our fallen brothers and sisters of law enforcement who have made the ultimate sacrifice. Attended by thousands and televised on C-SPAN for the world to see, the National Fraternal Order of Police will host its 41st annual National Peace Officers Memorial Service. This year, we will honor 563 officers who gave their all. Planning for this event is a year-long labor of love for a small army of selfless volunteers. Today, we're joined by Glenda Lehman, President of the National Fraternal Order of Police Auxiliary Board. In extension of the National Fraternal Order of Police, the Auxiliary works hand-in-hand -hand with concerns of police survivors during the week-long events that make up Police Week in Washington, D.C. We're also joined by Andy Mabo and Matt Hagen, co-chairs of the National Fraternal Order Police Memorial Committee. Andy is a canine officer with the United States Capitol Police and is former president of the FOP DC Lodge One. And Matt is a deputy sheriff with the Hennepin County Sheriff's Office and president of the Minnesota Fraternal Order of Police. I'm Patrick Hughes, national president of Fraternal Order Police, and this is The Blue View. Well, Glenda, Andy and, and Matt, thank you for joining us. Uh, for this episode of, of the Blue View. But uh, Glenda, let's start with you. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, I joined the Fraternal Order of Police Auxiliary in the early 90s. Uh, became involved with the organization um, as support to my husband. And then over the years, we had several other family members that also um, joined law enforcement. And as a result of that, um, being a part of the auxiliary allowed me to give support back to law enforcement, but also back to families uh, through that. Over the last eight months, uh, I've served as the National Auxiliary President. Uh, prior to that, was in leadership on the National Executive Board for a little over uh, 18 years, and then have had the opportunity to work across the state uh, in Kentucky, as well as locally, uh, to provide support. Uh, and Andy, how about you? So I joined law enforcement back in 1999 with the U.S. Capitol Police. I uh, joined the FOP right out of the academy. Um, from there, I started within the uh, ranks of the Capitol Police uh, Labor Committee, our, our basically our, our version of an, of an FOP lodge. Um, worked all the way up to uh, chairman of the Capitol Police Labor Committee. And then I got involved with DC Lodge One, where I ended up uh, going up the ranks there and uh, becoming president of uh, DC Lodge One. I've been involved with the National Memorial Service, not only through my own agency, but with the, uh, the National Fraternal Order of Police being part of the Memorial Committee since 2008. Okay. I currently am uh, on, on K-9 with the uh, Capitol Police, so I serve as a buffer between uh, both entities for the uh, National Memorial Service. Well, great. And, and Matt, how about you? A little bit about yourself. Uh, I started in law enforcement in 1999. I worked for a local sheriff's office here in Minneapolis. Um, I was fortunate enough. I had some older um, officers that got me uh, to join the FOP right when I got hired. Um, so I've been a member since I basically since I got hired. I uh, started in my local lodge, took some local lodge leadership roles, and then ultimately um, took a lodge on our, our role on our state lodge board, and I'm currently the state president in Minnesota. Um, I got involved in police week. Uh, especially with the memorial service in 2006 or seven, uh, started volunteering and helping the committee, and then I was appointed to my current uh, role as co-chair in 2019. Well, great. Uh, you know, I've, I've I've been around the uh, memorial service for a, a few decades now, and and just have all been in awe of the uh, of the work that's done by so many people to make that fitting tribute uh, so, you know, special for for the families. Uh, there's basically two parts to this is there's the uh, auxiliary side who works very closely with concerns of police survivors and all of the planning it takes with that. And then also on the, on the memorial side itself, when we have our service on a lawn of the Capitol, Andy, why don't you tell us for, for our listeners who might not be familiar with our national peace officers, memorial service, which this will be our 40, 41st annual uh, peace officers, memorial service. Could you talk a little bit about, the, the service itself. And then we'll, uh, Glenda, we'll talk about the planning it takes on the auxiliary side uh, to, to put everything in motion. Sure. So back in 1962, 
uh, President Kennedy uh, issued a proclamation stating that May 15th was the National Peace Officers Memorial Day. Um, that basically started Police Week. Um, it wasn't until 1982 where the first uh, National Memorial Service was held. It was held on Washington, in Washington, D.C., in one of the Senate parks back then. 120 people were in attendance, is what we're told. Um, and now it's grown to, to where here we are, our 41st uh, memorial service, and where we're getting anywhere from 30 to 50,000 police officers from around the world. Yeah, and, and interesting to note with that, uh, that very first one uh, that was held in 1982, half of the attendees were a Boy Scout troop that were on a field trip and stopped when they saw the services happening. That, and that marked the very first uh, Fraternal Order Police National Peace Officers Memorial Day, uh, something that, that has grown into what it is today. And it's, it's not a coincidence uh, that May 15th just happens to be the day that the Fraternal Order Police was recognized as an organization having their first meeting on the 14th and the 15th city administration uh, recognizing them in Pittsburgh. So it just shows the role that the FOP has played over the years. Uh, thank you, Andy. Uh, Linda, I know th the other side of this, there's so much stuff going on for the surviving families that come from all over the country uh, to participate in functions uh, training and, and sessions with uh, with cops, and then a coordination with cops that allows us to bring them to the Capitol and have the memorial service. You talk a little bit about what happens on on the auxiliary side in the planning uh, leading up to our memorial service. Sure. So there's a committee both uh, made up of members on the auxiliary side as well as the FOP side, and we work together um, amongst both of those committees, but also with several other organizations. Um, it's a year round commitment. Um, these individuals are dedicated to ensuring that we're preparing a service that truly honors those officers who've made the supreme sacrifice, but also to ensure that as we're preparing that service, we're taking into the account the impact that the service has on their families. You know, it can be a very emotional and a very difficult time, as well as a very, um, honorable and happy time for them to see that their officer is actually remembered and honored. Throughout the year, we have the committees that are meeting. They're doing the review of the names that were submitted uh, to be considered for the service. And a large part of that is to ensure that the names are spelled correctly, to make sure that they're printed correctly in the programs, but to also make sure that they are engraved correctly on the medals. When the medals come in, we have a group that also hand inspects each one of the medals to ensure that they're graved appropriately, that there's not any mistakes on it, and that the na officer's name is correct. They work alongside uh, the FOP and uh, several other agencies to ensure that we have transportation that is ready to move the survivors on uh, National Peace Officers Memorial Day to get them down to the site uh, so that they're there uh, we bring them in and ensure that we have seating that is set up specifically for them and ensure that they are seated so that when their officer's name is read, they're actually walking in honor of their officer and that they're placing that flower for their officer. There's a lot that goes into that because not only do we want to make sure that the service and all the aspects of putting on the service are in place, but also making sure that we're providing support. So when the survivors come in, it's a very emotional week. And so we want to be able to have support services there and available to them as they go through this experience. Part of it is ensuring that we're very compassionate and very understanding at what they're facing, as well as bringing that honor uh, to them for their officer. There's a lot that goes into uh, small things in the background for making sure that the site is set up correctly to ensure that we have the appropriate security uh, that's there to making sure that we can move the survivors to the site and through security in a safe way. And also making sure that um, during the service, um, we do what's called a blue um, ribbon song. And so it's ensuring that all of the survivors have access to those blue ribbons. So when that takes place during the service, they're able to actually fly that ribbon in honor of their officer as well. So it's a year long commitment that these members put into, but it's something that they're very passionate about, something that they're very dedicated to. And it's truly an honor to be a part of that process and be a part of that committee to be able to give back to these families. 
You know, I mentioned uh, just just in awe of watching how a full year of planning uh, and all of the work that goes into the small army that it takes in order to pull this off uh, if it's seamless. Uh, you do a great job with it uh, on the auxiliary side with all of the planning that it takes to, to make sure all of these, the, the logistics of all of this happens. But on the site itself, there's a, a transformation as well. It's, uh, it's the lawn of the U.S. Capitol, and there's a lot of planning and, and preparations that have to happen, you know, have to take place there as well. And, and Matt and Andy, you play a big role in, in, in making sure of transforming that front lawn into uh, what's, what's called the rest, rest front, the, uh, the memorial service that, that, that we're grown accustomed to over the years. Matt, can you talk a little bit about taking possession of the, of the lawn and how we transform it into to the space that we, uh, that we, that's needed in order to accommodate such a large group? Well, so the first step is just to be able to get permission to use the lawn. Uh, we do a joint congressional resolution that's passed by the House and Senate. Uh, that gives us access to the lawn for police week. Uh, once that gets signed by Congress, then we are able to um, work with our vendors and move in and start setting the site up um, so we can have our service. Our goal has always been um, to have this service very personal um, for those that are attending, whether it's a uh, surviving family member, partner, uh, past year survivor that's attending, um, or the other officers that are attending, um, just uh, or the general public. Um, our goal has always been to have a very personal service. Um, We've come to realize that a lot of these agencies, especially during COVID right now, a lot of these officers are not being properly honored with the funeral at home. So we're looking at this, that our service is kind of, a lot of times is going to be the funeral that they never had. So um, it takes a small army during police week, uh, especially on the site to transform it from the West Front um, to, to have it set up for our service. Um, and there's a lot of planning that goes into it ahead of time, especially working with our partner agencies, U.S. Capitol Police. Uh, and then depending on um, if the president shows up working with Secret Service and the White House staff, um, there's a lot of, lot of moving parts uh, to get the site ready. Um, so it's ready for our service, but it's also safe for everybody attending, especially on the current climate. There's a lot of security challenges that we face with that. Um, and I have to give Andy, my coach, a lot of credit uh, for working through a lot of the process with that to make sure that we're able to have it, have the service be safe and that we can still um, put on the service that we expect and the survivors expect. Yeah. Uh, and Andy, uh, you know, more often than not, the president does attend this memorial service. Uh, I'd say probably 85, 90% of the memorial services we've had in recent uh, years in the last 30 years, the president has had a, had a presence there, but it certainly attracts uh, a lot of other members of Congress and in heads of, uh, of, of, of the president's cabinet. Uh, that, just the amount of people alone is enough security concerns, but uh, adding all of these extra people to this and in the world stage, because it is broadcast on C-SPAN, all of that creates uh, security challenges. Can you, can you speak a little bit about the preparations that are in place to make sure that we have an, a safe and uh, respectful memorial service for, for all in attendance? Sure. Well, <clears throat> you know, to, to begin, you know, all the partners involved with Police Memorial Week, and, uh, you know, putting on May 15th are involved in all the planning from when we first start, you know, the, when the service is over in May, you know, we take a couple months off, but usually by September, October, we're back at it already planning. Um, and here in DC, all, all the major stakeholders from Capitol police, the Metropolitan police, U S park police, you know, so many, uh, agencies, uh, are involved with making sure that everything goes flawless uh, for this event. You know, Secret Service. Um, you know, we're all we're all there for the same purpose, and we're all there. You know, coordinating with one another, making sure the intel doesn't give us any type of threats, making sure that we're putting all the security measures into place um, so that the it, the families have the memorial service they properly need. Um, additionally. You know, so we could get all the additional assets in also, you know, when you stop and you look at it, you know, this year alone, we have 160 ceremonial motorcycles coming from across the country. We have over 35 horse mounted units bringing their horses in. We have bagpipers, you know, from across the country, you know, all coming in for this service. And when you look at all of our stakeholders that, you know, that do the planning for the memorial service, 
So each person is screened. Each each person, you know, that is in uniform has their proper driver's license, government ID, credential, badge. Everything is checked prior to coming in because of the amount of security, you know, for those who are both in uniform and armed and those who are coming off the street because this is open to the public as well. Yeah, and it's a, there's certainly a lot of work goes into to all of this, all these moving parts and keeping it keeping it on time, transporting hundreds of people from Virginia into the service and, and all of the all of the other parts that touch. Uh, Glenda, I know that that over the years you you have contact with the family uh, probably a little bit more than than maybe Andy and Matt do because you're at the you're at the host hotel with cops and, and interacting with the families. What, what does this service mean to them? This service is extremely special because it gives them the honor to know that their officer truly isn't forgotten, that the sacrifice that they've made um, isn't just forgotten. And it allows them the opportunity in some instances, it's a part of their, grief process, but sometimes it's also a part of that healing process. It allows them to start the healing, uh, allows them to start looking at some of what the next steps are going to be. But it's truly important to them to know that um, there are the rest of the law enforcement community that still remembers their officer and still pays the respects for the sacrifice that was made. And then to be able to hear um, their officer's name actually read out loud and honored at the Capitol is something that is just priceless. It, it means so much to them and it gives them that honor to know that um, their officer is being recognized. It also allows them the opportunity to come in and be able to meet other families that are experiencing the same things that they're experiencing and being able to understand what they've gone through and what they are going through and what they're going to be going through and being able to provide that support to one another. And so it truly is an honor. And I know that we say that a lot, um, but the meaning behind that and the true appreciation uh, for the honor that we do give is something that is extremely priceless, but means very much and is very important to all of the families. You know, there are a number of events going on during police week. Uh, the candlelight vigils are very somber uh, and, and touching event that's hosted by the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial Fund. And uh, each one of the officers' names are read out loud. Uh, the service that we host allows the participants, uh, the, the families, to actually participate. Uh, they actually, when the name's called, they place a flower and they also meet with, uh, with well, you know, officers and, and with the presentation of a medal. So there's a, there's a, a physical connection to it too. Um, and it's gotta be touching to the, to the families. I would, I would think, What's, you know, do you have any to add on that? It, it is, um, being able to hearing the officer's name is very special, but as you pointed out, being able to actually walk and know that you're taking part in that honor and being able to place that flower for their officer, gives them the ability to say that they too are a part of the service and they too are um, giving that honor back to their officers. And when the presentation of that medal uh, is given to the family, it is an extremely uh, emotional and moving experience. But again, it's that, it's that physical part of being a part of the service that honors the officer for the sacrifice that they made. And to be able to have that to hold on to, to know um, that there's that symbolized piece that you still have to be able to say, um, this is what was given in honor from the law enforcement community. And it's just, it's very meaningful to them and something that um, they are very appreciative of and something that it's one of those moments that they remember for the rest of their lives. Yes. And, 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 as, as all of you know, and, and Glenda, probably more you than, than the others because of the planning part that you're doing on the on your side of it. Um, we went two years with not being able to have our memorial service on May 15th. Last year in October, we were able to, to do two years of honoring officers at the same time off of our normal schedule, but necessary to do so because the numbers are just unfortunately so high. And we thought in April, two years of falling officers would be our largest memorial service. And 
it uh, kind of pales in comparison to this year. Can you, you talk a little bit about uh, the process that's going through why our numbers are so high this year and, and what uh, the logistics problems that it creates for us uh, to have, have the service this year? This year's numbers are higher than any other prior years. Not only did we lose law enforcement officers through violence um, that took their lives, but also through um, disease and illness that they um, were contracted through the line of duty. When we receive a request for officers' names to be considered, uh, as long as the department indicates that it was line of duty and there's no other information that indicates otherwise, uh, we'll review that and ensure that it meets the guidelines. Uh, typically, when we look at line of duty, it means that that officer died doing a direct, in either a direct or proximate result of personal injury that they sustained, either taking an action that is required or obligated by law or rule or in a written condition of employment. And so outside of that, there are also some specific guidelines that we review uh, for death that is caused by a disease that was contracted as a result of exposure. That committee works year round to review those names to ensure that all officers are considered and to ensure that we make sure that all are included in the memorial service um, that truly did die in the line of duty. Having that large of a number of officers also increases the number of family members and coworkers that also attend the service. So logistically, it's planning for ensuring that we're recognizing all of those officers, but it's also making sure that we have planned for the families that are coming in, getting them into through registration, making sure that we have um, transportation set up so that we can ensure that we get them all to the memorial service the day of and making sure that um, we try and provide as much support as we can from giving them a light breakfast um, that morning uh, as they load the buses because it's going to be a very long day. Um, depending on the weather, it can change from being very warm to can change to being um, windy or rainy. And so it's making sure that we have things in place depending on what that weather is going to be like to make sure that they're uh, comfortable during that process and during the day so that they can focus on the actual memorial service and they can focus on the honor for their officers. And so we do what we can to try and ensure that that number of um, individuals all make it to the service, have a place to sit at the service and ensure that when we do read their officers' names, they're actually walking to place that flower and receive that medal for their officer. Great. And uh, the, so our memorial service will be on May 15th. Uh, Andy, around what time will the gates uh, open up so uh, so attendees could start uh, wheeling onto the property? Uh, at 8 a.m. is when the gates open for everybody to start coming in. Okay. And at 12 o'clock uh, sharp, we start, correct? That's correct. So there's a lot of logistics that uh, that has to happen between then and moving everyone. And, and it does make for a very long day. Uh, so we appreciate appreciate everyone's uh, patience. And, and remember, if you are coming, it's every one of the families uh, deserves the honor uh, of turning around and seeing uh, all, everyone there in place uh, during the memorial service when their loved one's name is called. So we ask everyone to please stay till the entire service is over. Uh, Again, I want to I want to thank each one of you um, and and all of the volunteers who help you do the, the 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 great work that you do over the years. You know, I've gone to memorial service for years and and had people pat me on the back about what a what a great memorial service that uh, that we put on. And in reality, I haven't done anything. I just showed up, uh, just like everyone else. Uh, it took a small army to to make all of this go off the way it it, it does. In in you're the ones that uh, that hold the glue together and and keep everybody moving in the right direction. So I want to I want to personally thank you uh, for all of the hard work that you do in honoring our fallen. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll start with you, Glenda. Final thoughts. Uh, just uh, we'll wrap this up. I just I I think that um, my appreciation goes out to the committees um, that work year round and put their dedication into ensuring that it is uh, the service uh, that the officers uh, so deserve. But also at the same time, it's, it's remembering and being compassionate and understanding to the families that are coming in to ensure that we give them the support that they need that week uh, as they go through um, all the week and the different events that are happening, as well as the memorial service. 
and being able to ensure that they have the support that they need. Uh, to me, it's kind of making sure that our motto is alive and that when we say that we never want them to walk alone, that we're putting that action in there and providing them a service and during that, that we give them what they need so that they aren't walking it alone. Great. Uh, thank you. Andy? So, you know, you, you look back 40 years ago and, and granted I wasn't there, but, you know, for such a small service that transformed into such an emotional impact on law enforcement across the, the world, you know, and I say world because we do have so many international officers that, that come from all over uh, the world to attend this event. It, it's amazing how much the Fraternal Order of Police, the Fraternal Order of Police Auxiliary have you know, made this memorial service into what it is for these families. And, you know, I could tell you for myself, it's been the most humbling experience I've, I've experienced in law enforcement. Um, you know, to be able to, to give these families the, the final send off for their loved one, where they receive their medal of honor, they're recognized nationally, along with the fact of, of building the friendships and the camaraderie from, you know, planning this and, and, um, you know, being a part of, of this service, it's just, you know, absolutely unexplainable, uh, of how much of a moving, um, emotional experience this is, you know, and, and as one of the co-chairs of this event, I can't thank, you know, everyone enough for not only allowing myself and, and my committee to, to be a part of this, but, you know, the, the auxiliary, you know, they have such an amazing role in this, you know, and dealing with the families that it, it really takes, like you said, Pat, a small army. And I'll tell you, this has been one of the best armies I've ever served with. Well, thank you. And, and Matt? I have to echo what Andy says. Some of the, the people that we're serving on these committees with um, are some of the most dedicated individuals I've ever worked with. Um, the long days and the all the hard work of the goes into it. Um, they rise up to every challenge that we face with it, especially the auxiliary. Um, the coordination on their part uh, that it takes to stay organized and get our survivors through to the site and properly honored uh, is nothing short of amazing. Um, for me to serve on this committee, it's been uh, very humbling. Um, I really, truly believe that it's an honor and I, it's a privilege for me to do it. Um, I've done a lot in my 23 year career in law enforcement, but, um, in October when I was able to, uh, lead the survivors from the buses into their seats was probably one of the most humbling experiences of my career. Um, and it's tough because the size of the service, but I think, um, we are always striving to make that service more personal, personal for, um, all the surviving family and friends and, and officers, um, and do everything we can. Uh, so we do not forget those officers that have made the ultimate sacrifice. Um, like I said, we're, we're always looking to do better and to try to improve the service and um, do the best we can with it to honor them. You know, I'll look out there uh, sitting, you know, standing on that stage before the families pour in and, and, and all of the, uh, you know, all those who attend our memorial service. And, and what you'll see uh, before it fills up is that uh, in the middle of the, uh, the, uh, the stage is white chairs and on each side, it's different color chairs. They all distinguish uh, different people who sit in them, but the white chairs are where the surviving families are. And it's all about the white chairs. It's all about paying honor to those who have fallen and recognizing the families uh, and their sacrifices as well. And, uh, and you three uh, had a team of, of just some outstanding, amazing people who, uh, who, have this this great power of taking a, a few seconds in someone's life and having it preserved forever. And I want to thank you for for what you do in in honor in our fallen, and uh, and encourage everyone to uh, to to please participate. Uh, come to our memorial service uh, May fifteenth at the uh, west front of the U.S. Capitol. Uh, gates will open up at eight, and we will start sharply at twelve o'clock. And uh, also, if you can't make it to Washington, D.C., it will be streamed live uh, on C-SPAN. Uh, so, again, thank you. And I thank you for, for being part of our uh, epi this episode of Blue View. 
and our listeners and viewers, thank you for, for tuning in and, and listen to the things that are important to the men and women who suit up and show up in communities all across this country, uh, making a difference in the lives of those they serve. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks for tuning into this week's episode of The Blue View, hosted by Patrick Joes, National President of the Fraternal Order of Police. To catch our next episode, be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere else you get your podcasts. To get the latest from the National FOP, make sure to follow us on Twitter and Facebook at GLFOP and on Instagram at FOP National. Thanks again. We'll see you next time.